thank you so much for joining us um, in the breakout sessions. Um, predominantly looking about how Homes England are enabling build to rent. We've got Gareth Blacker here, General Manager in Investment, talking about some of the things and some of the work that we've done within the build to rent sector. And then we've got Graham Sibley here from um, NHBC, he's a business manager, um, just talking about how NHBC is looking to support into that sector as well, alongside Homes England, to kind of real drive these things forward. Mm. And then Leslie Chen Davidson, the Director of Banking and Treasury at Delancey, and also Kath Webster, Exec Director of Strategy and Investment and Quintain. So we're going to kick off first with Gareth with about a 10-minute presentation and then come to some questions. I've got some. I hope you do have your own questions to bring up through Slido as well. Thank you. Over to you, Gareth. Thanks, Sophie. Um, just make sure this is working. Maybe it's not. Ah, here we go. Slightly delayed. Right, let's get going. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour through a little bit of background to the, the Homes England, the agency, but focusing mainly on what we're doing in the build-to-rent sector and actually what we've done in our pedigree in that sector. Just a quick touch on historic activity. Homes England and predecessor body, HCA, been involved in the built to rent sector since it really started to develop some momentum. So our first chief executive, Sir Bob Kerslick, was a really early evangelist for the sector, was keen that we brought things forward. And even pre-Montague, uh, we did a deal with Barclay Homes that took forward a portfolio of 550 uh, built to rent prop properties across a range of sites that was ultimately acquired by M&G after it had been managed as a platform by Barclay for a couple of years. So right at the, at the uh, vanguard of the build to rent movement and have been ever since. That was uh, as HCA. There is a lot of continuity from the predecessor bodies, but we are very much a new agency. The government has been repurposing Homes England and increasing the scale, increasing the amount of funding available, putting us into a very prominent position in the industry and we're the, the sort of the, the leader for government in terms of participation. Uh, we have a strategic plan that was published in the autumn. Uh, that, that followed on from a launch of Homes England earlier in 2018. And it's actually, as strategic plans go, a very accessible document, a very readable document. There's a copy here, and there's copies outside on the Homes England stand. And it is actually worth picking up and having a look at it. Tools include, and I'll not dwell on this, but basically we have a very big land portfolio, huge amounts of funding across infrastructure, lending into SMEs and lending into infrastructure, lending grant into uh, infrastructure, the Housing Infrastructure Fund, expertise, uh, all the people that you would need to take forward major development uh, within the agency, and we have a wide range of powers, including compulsory purchase and planning if necessary. In terms of the relevance for today, the main area of where funding comes into uh, build to rent is going to be through the home building fund and this is effectively a simplified structure historically we've had a range of funds going at the same time uh, caused a lot of confusion in the market what we managed to do is work with treasury and mhclg to come up with a simple one-stop shop for funding which is the home building fund and this is funding that goes to private sector developers and registered providers um, it's four and a half billion pounds, two and a half billion of that is development finance, two billion is into infrastructure and I'll go through some practical examples in a moment and particularly working with some of our partners who we've got on the panel today. Just in terms of some of our key metrics, I'll just touch on this quickly for people interested in this and I think what we can say is if you are interested in talking about any specific scenarios or opportunities that you might want to look at, as well as myself and Sophie have been here, we have a number of our team also here. You can find people on the Homes England stand. If there's particular things you want to talk about, we can do that offline. 
Effectively, the development finance is pretty much what you'd expect to see from any other lender, but what we are looking at doing, we've bigger uh, risk appetite, but we're not competing. What we're looking at doing is funding where maybe a bank or other lender might not be able to or want to. Uh, so there's a particular focus on the SME sector, um, but potentially in build to rent, although we have done a lot of senior lending in the past, maybe a focus on MES funding. Uh, our infrastructure funding is slightly different in that there is very limited amounts of this sort of funding available, if any, from mainstream lenders. And this is where we take a much longer term position on a, on a development up to 10 years. Uh, and we'll say a little bit more about how that works in, in a moment. Loan size goes a minimum as a quarter of a million on the SME side, five homes up to, at this moment in time, the biggest individual loan we've done is an infrastructure loan at Canary Wharf on Wood Wharf at 200 million pounds. Um, our margin, it, we've, we've a, a state aid approved reference rate, which is pretty close to 12 month LIBOR, and then the margin on that ranges from 220 to maybe up to 1,000 BIPs. Fees, quite limited. Uh, half a percent on development finance, one percent on the infrastructure, and depending on the deal, there might be a profit share structure that we'll look at as well. So in terms of how the agencies engage with Build to Rent, after the initial activity with Barclay Homes and the Montague Review, out of that came the Build to Rent Fund, a billion pound of investment, and that is where the agency might come into something on a market-making basis. So we had a lot of discussions with institutions saying they want to invest in build to rent but nobody's funding but not wanting development exposure and risk nobody's providing the stock so we with treasury agreed we'd put a fund in place to allow us to work with developers to create um, a build to rent market or start the creation of that build to rent market we started out doing uh, senior lending ourselves so east village with QDD was one of the first major deals that we did, 181 million in a senior position going into just over 900 homes in the old Olympic Village site, building on the Get Living platform. Um, at the same time, banks then started to engage with us. We started looking at club structures. One of the really early deals that Sophie did was with Essential Living, but with RBS, where we sat side by side. We did another one at uh, the Newfoundland Tower at Canary Wharf, and banks started to work with us. They, they took comfort from our participation. And then to an extent that brought us to a place where generally senior lending was available into the, into the build to rent sector. We accept in some circuits, it's still difficult to access and we'll look at um, opportunities as they come up, but we're generally finding with the right developer and the right scheme, senior lending is reasonably available. I'll not go through the detail of this because Leslie might say a little bit more about her scheme itself. But, uh, one of the interesting things though here was, and just touch on this, in terms of innovation and modern methods of construction, we have the, uh, the jump factory. So Mace was the main contractor on the scheme uh, and very interesting construction techniques being you had been used in the Netherlands. First time it had been brought to the UK. Um, we were keen to see how this would work. And it, it was relatively eff effective. It was the first go and something I think will continue to, to evolve. But um, effectively what was happening is you had a factory on site with assembly at different stages on a number of the, the floors with each week the, the factory would be moved up a floor, a sort of hydraulic push and a, just a really unusual, interesting uh, structure and it's sort of the MMC area is something that we're always keen to encourage and look at that sort of innovation. Um, the journey for us in Build to Rent though then may be moving away from senior, le senior lending into mezzanine funding. So really good example of that was Dandara. Um, three big sites in Birmingham, Leeds and Manchester. Uh, they had a position with HSBC, who get them up to 60% uh, of the cost of delivery of the schemes, but not enough equity for them to take, of their own availability, to take all of the schemes forward. They were struggling to raise finance. They worked with Treasury and their guarantee program, just 
seemed to get stuck, we had a look at it and basically what we agreed to do was take a, a MES position across all three sites on the basis though that all of the schemes then commenced simultaneously. So effectively what we were doing here is although there were viable schemes, by our participation we were getting 2,000 homes starting at the same time rather than perhaps one of the schemes happening, it working through, receipts being recycled and then on to the next one. So what we're doing is making things happen more quickly. Uh, and I think MES provision is something that we would continue to see that as, a, as an area of activity for us in terms of the bill to rent sector. This one's also interesting in that the, the VEN guarantee or the government PRS guarantees come in, comes into play in terms of the refinance. Keeping going on, probably one of our main areas of focus now, and this is reflected in Actually, Letwin has picked up on this almost after we have been doing it for probably three, three and a half years now, is we have the infrastructure fund, and this is where we'll put money into upfront infrastructure, getting developers taking forward more activity on site much earlier in development. Uh, what we are keen then is that that's combined with a range of tenures, so built to rent particularly, whatever the developer's comfortable with in terms of sale and then affordable housing. So another good example, just before Christmas, we signed with uh, Balfour Beatty and Places for People on the Eastwick and Sweetwater site at the Olympic Park, and that was almost split 1,500 homes, a third, a third, a third, between built to rent sale and uh, affordable. And the first phase has got a, a takeoff with Realstar taking the, uh, the built to rent. Um, but that combination of infrastructure funding and placemaking combined with build to rent tenure can lead to really strong acceleration of delivery. So it's an area that we're really keen to develop. One of our best examples of that is at uh, Wembley with Quintain, and again, Kath will probably talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, largest single build to rent scheme going at the moment. And there's a mistake, it says HCA invested 65, so it's Homes England that invested 65 million. Um, but here, if this was a standard development for sale, we'd probably be looking at 20 years to take through the, the whole scheme with the model that Quintain are bringing forward and bringing forward at pace. You're reducing this by at least a half in terms of delivery time scales. Um, another example of that was, is Wood Wharf where we're working with Canary Wharf Group. Again, it was creating the, the development platform, so a combination pound for pound, 200 million of infrastructure funding from us, uh, 200 million of Canary Wharf equity to create that development platform. Off the back of that, uh, we had a structure into creditor, everything agreed with four banks to take forward the first four residential buildings on the site, 1,600 homes, half of those built to rent. So again, it's that combination of infrastructure and build to rent tenure that's really leading to the placemaking and acceleration of delivery. And it's an area I think we will want to develop further. In addition to, to debt, we also will look at potential for equity investment in schemes. If it's the right project and the right scheme where maybe confidence needs to be given to the market, PRS, Family housing is something that we're very keen to look at, uh, particularly with the nature of our own portfolio and land, which is very uh, much edge of town, bigger sites, so things like Northstow and Cambridge. We've got a lot of land we've, uh, we've, we hold from historic uh, commission for New Towns days, other things like that, but it's often not suitable for main big scale, build to rent, central, city or even edge of city centre type development. Sigma Capital had been working at, at a reasonable scale on uh, family PRS, uh, but were very keen, they were very positive about the op this, that this could be scaled up very significantly. Wanted to go to market with a REIT, um, talk to us, we had been working with them on some of the northern sites, but talk to us about would we be prepared to sort of cornerstone the REIT be in the prospectus to give encouragement to the market. So we took a 9.9% stake, 25 million going in up front. 
really, really strong response. That's since been out to the market again, so over 500 million of equity, matching amounts of debt. So within 12, 13 months, a billion pounds of funding available to go into uh, family PRS, and that's producing homes at scale moving forward very quickly. Key to that was the pipeline though, so Countryside, Galliford Try, and uh, Keep Moat Homes, all part of delivering that package. Uh, another area that you'll have picked up on in the press is we have our affordable housing program, but actually we're looking now at scaling our activity with registered providers up. We've got a series of strategic partnerships, which we're going to see as our key way of engaging with RPs going forward. There'll still be the mainstream affordable housing grant, but we see a real opportunity in terms of working with uh, RPs to enter into the build to rent sector in greater detail and there'll be there's a number of opportunities coming forward there and then finally we do have uh, a development arm ourselves we have the english cities fund which is a joint venture between ourselves legal and general and muse and we will put our money where our mouth is so within that vehicle we've been taking forward build to rent development in salford and in canning town and those schemes have been coming forward successfully and have been taken forward by management platforms uh, and we're really pleased with the outcome there. So the vehicle at English Cities Fund, we've got a lot more equity going in from all parties and we're actually in a position now to be looking at schemes. So if you're either local authority background or working with local authorities, one of the real strengths of the English Cities Fund is, it, is its ability to work with public sector partners in terms of residentially led, but maybe challenging regen type schemes. Uh, and again, we'd be very happy to, to hear from you, both myself and Sophie are working on the board of the, of the company. So another area where we can take forward um, development activity. So that's a real whistle stop tour for me in terms of the agency's activities in the sector. Thanks, Gareth. So Gareth. <clears throat> Gareth and I run the infrastructure and complex projects team together at Homes England, so I have to be really nice to him. That wasn't bad timing, it's very good. <laughs> so, um, right, Leslie, you were probably one of our earliest um, borrowers in terms of the sort of the build rent funding that was there. Just tell a little bit about sort of how that was and how things are now for you at Get, Loving, Get Living and the wider platform. Sure. So, <clears throat> I guess first we have to. Uh, we have to go back a bit and remember where we started from. You know, we actually did have one um, built to rent finance in place, which was put in place in 2013. But that was before built to rent was actually a term that anybody understood or even acknowledged, right? Built to rent and PRS. We throw them around now as though they're, you know, common terminology and it's one of the most focused sectors in the UK market today. But back in 2013, and I'm not kidding you, I probably sh knocked on the door of every single relationship lender that Delancey had for about 15, 16 months, asking for development finance <clears throat> for a rental product. And every lender without fail said, well, Leslie, that's spec finance then. That's spec development, right? If you don't have your sales, a build for sale product, which is what they had been used to financing, um, we just don't do it. Eventually, after some time, I did convince two relationship lenders to come together. They provided a 100 million pound facility, 50 million each, but only at 50% loan to cost and, and not, so, and not very, pretty expensive, actually. So we, we did it um, and we got through it. But just about then, which is when you know, I think the Homes England program started kicking in, and we were about to start a development phase at East Village, where we already had 1,439 units, but we wanted to start the development of our next thousand. The total costs would have required three, you know, some 350 million pounds of finance. Given the experience we'd had with all the other banks, I mean, it, it would have been an impossibility, frankly, to get that project off the ground had the Homes England Building Guarantee Fund not been available at that time. So with their assistance, um, you know, and it was a process because we were learning, weren't we, together mm. at the time. <clears throat> how to get this right. And even then, you know, by the way, you know, we, we were kept in the program because, of course, Homes England said, Leslie, you can't have all of our money. <laughs> um, so I did have to find a subordinated lender, but that was fine. And, and be, due to the attractive pricing of the financing that uh, Homes England were able to offer, I was able to accommodate a subordinated financing in place. So, you know, 
that was a great experience because that allowed our project to get off the ground. We just recently PC'd the first phase of that, which is 500 units, and we're in the ground with the next 500 units now. So that 1,000 units started and completed you know, and will complete due to the financing that we received from Homes England. So that was very much appreciated. And what's great is that we continue that partnership and we continue talking about other ways we can work together. Um, I think, you know, primarily because we all want to see more housing built um, and we believe that working together we can get more done. Yeah, absolutely. And then, Sir Kath, you were sort of our new generation of lending within Build to Rent, as Gareth touched on, more about infrastructure rather than bricks and mortar. So tell us a little bit about that, how that went. Yeah, sure. So actually it was a pretty similar path mm. in the fact that Quintain had come out with its big strategy that it was switching from build to sell to build to rent, and we had this very large amount of units that we wanted to build. Um, and doing it on an individual development basis would have, well, been impossible. Um, I think you've probably heard several times over there how many we're building, but it was around 3,000 units. Um, and so actually we went for the main facility, we had a corporate development loan. It was a very innovative structure, um, but we totally capped out at the outset at 760, but pushed it up to 800 million. That didn't cover all of the development. There was a massive amount of infrastructure that needed to go in. Um, just to give you an idea, it's roughly about 50% land coverage at Wembley. So um, the other 50% is parks um, and p areas for placemaking, but we also had to put in district heating. Um, we also had to build car parks because we were actually building on the, um, the, the hard standing that was the car park. We had to create more car parks for the stadium um, in order to free up more housing for, for a later date. Um, and so that's why we approached Homes England to see if they could help with sort of filling that gap. Um, as Gareth said, we have 65 million from them, which we match fund with 65 million for the construction of car parks, um, some of the placemaking um, areas, and our energy centre, um, which we signed in 2017, and we're continuing to draw. Okay. And in terms of... In terms of our primary attraction in ter for build to rent, it's a lot about acceleration. And modular building is a big part of that. And Graham, I know you were here last year talking about modular and, and sort of how that is. Just talk about from NHBC's perspective and your perspective, what's been happening in that space sort of over the last 12 months. Sure, yeah. Um, this time last year, I was talking alongside Mark Farmer. He was outlining where he wanted to see things going. I think in some respects, things have moved quite a long way, in other ways they haven't. One of the key things uh, that he's looking for is a mutually agreed assurance definition, uh, whereby all warranty providers can work, can, can, can sign up to all insurance, lenders can have a, an agreed protocol um, for what actually constitutes assurance and insurance on homes built using modular um, construction methods. Not just volumetric, but the whole gamut. Yeah. Um, so we've seen, um, a lot of um, less sophisticated, I guess I'll call it that. Um, we see um, rather than the full volumetric modular coming through, um, which is relatively slow, I think that's, that capacity will build. We've seen a lot of panelised systems, a lot of other, other componentry coming forward, which is all built off site um, and then does speed up the, 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 uh, the, the delivery on site. Um, that protocol um, is taking a little longer than I think Mark and the rest of us would like, but we're still in negotiations with all those, those people to get to that point, and I believe there'll be some announcement on that by the, by the middle of this year. That will be a real positive move forward to give that confidence that any home that has a warranty, that has modular components, will be able, will be able, to, lend, be able to lend on normal terms, insure on normal terms, and meet the... the uh, the, res the reasonable expectations of both homeowners who are privately buying, but also lenders and investors. We see the investor um, um, and the asset owner as people we're protecting, as a, as a warranty insurance company. Um, we do an, an awful lot of work pre-construction. Um, you know, the earliest we, we can engage with design um, to identify potential issues in, in delivery, not just on modular, but on the overall design, how that's fitted together, how the interconnections are made, how the cladding's put together for materials that are used. Um, the earlier we can engage on those before any design's locked down, then we can uh, go, they, the, 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 uh, the client can go to tender to contractors with a known specification. The contractor has more certainty, 
the contractor client relationship and the relationship with us can be a lot better um, and we can work more collaboratively with that team to, to deliver and offer and at the end of the day provide that protection to the asset owner. Mm -hmm. And in terms of modular then, so Leslie Gareth talked earlier about the jump factory and mm -hmm. you're just starting into NA6 and thinking again, just tell us a little bit about the experience that you've had through delivery through development and sort of where you're going in terms of that or precision build off site accelerating delivery methods. Sure, I mean, you know, we continue to, to explore it. We continue to just um, look at other alternative ways. The Jump Factory was quite exciting, as, as mm. Gareth mentioned, and it, and it looks fantastic. You know, it's this big wrapper <laughs> around the building that just kept moving up, you know, every four floors. And it was a new technology. But um, did it make things more efficient? Did it make things cheaper? I don't think yet, um, being frank. But what it did do for us was it kept our estate a bit more tidy, okay, so it kept it hidden away, and we tried something new, which is, I think, important. I think the point, you know, I think we feel that we can, need to continue to explore new technologies. Um, it is more difficult, I will say, developing in central London. You know, for those of you who are developers or contractors, you'll understand that, you know, moving and uh, maneuvering in tight spaces in a central uh, city location makes modular a little bit more difficult, but these methods are being, you know, they're constantly changing and there's more innovation. And, I, you know, I just attended a meeting on Monday where, you know, one of the, oh, an architect said, I, I've got a really great thing. It's not volumetric. It's like, it's something new. It's like, I've got the IP for it. I said, when, we, when can we use it? You know, so, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I think, you know, I, I think all of the big developers are hoping that we can find some real efficiencies through modular construction. We just haven't been able to find the technology that we can use in our estates yet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we are definitely looking at regions where I think, it is more applicable, um, and we continue to evaluate. Yeah, and Kath, from <clears throat> your perspective, and I know some of your other colleagues have been here today, with Wembley Park, you have an extraordinary number of homes, almost unprecedented in one delivery. Presumably you're starting to think about different methods of construction and how you really do get that acceleration. Mm. Yeah, we are, and we have, um, we have employed those uh, various methods of off-site construction. Um, the problem that we always had was the speed we were going and the capacity mm -hmm. in order to be able to adopt it because that you know there was a lag between that industry and where we needed to be in terms of our build profile. Um, we are looking now for our next phase. Um, <laughs> phase one, it looks, looks great. We'll be finished you know, between now and 2022. So we're starting on the planning on the next phase and I think that's really where it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interesting... Um, discussion, mm -hmm. um, especially now that we can sort of look to see what other people have been doing. But um, my concern would still be around capacity. Um, my next concern would then be, you know, without you guys there, I think we are um, still educating lenders as to how to think about taking security over yeah. assets awesome. that are sitting off site. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, it's obviously very different to the to the normal model. Um, not to say it can't be done, it's just another um, iteration of the journey. Yeah. And Gareth, there was a question asked on Slido this morning when Kit was speaking actually about sort of Homes England's view on modular and what we think about that. Do you want to just touch on that? Yeah, so I think from <coughs> the, ex the sort of the perspective of experimentation and trying new things, things that might make development happen, happen more quickly happen more cost effectively, we're very interested in exploring those. So if it comes forward as part of a development, we will probably take a fairly uh, proactive role that perhaps other lenders might be less inclined to do. So when Delancey came forward with the concept of the jump factory as part of our, the funding going in and the construction methodology at East Village, we were really keen to back that and see how, it, how that would work through. On other schemes that we're taking forward, it's in a number of cases, it's a really key part of the overall development. And actually, there's a deal we just closed just at the end of last month with one of our strategic partners, Swan Housing Association, or Swan New Homes, actually. It was their, pri their private development arm. Big scheme down in Basildon, but where uh, they have actually developed their own factory for the provision of um, the, the materials into, the, into that development and other developments. And it was getting a lot of coverage on 
BBC One news yesterday morning running through, uh, and that was really good to see that. But that's the sort of those sort of things that maybe other lenders might be less yeah. inclined to do or take that risk. It's something we're very keen to do yeah. and will continue to look at. Uh, and I think that's, that's how NHBC approached it as well. As you can imagine, we were approached by a plethora, a huge number of new systems manufacturers, new products and whatever else to assess. What we, what we look to is where the market demand is going to be. Are there developers coming forward with it? Are there investors, built to rent developers and landlords and, and, and housing associations? A lot of housing associations drive on this. So we have to take those, those seriously first because we know that's where there's potential demand for. The more we can assess them early, the more hopefully we can get them quicker to market um, and on a scalable level. And I guess in many ways, Graham, the Homes England is all about giving comfort to the market, that supporting build to rent. But actually, just tell us a little bit about what NHBC can do within that space as well. Yeah, yeah. I guess um, so, so. I guess we are known primarily um, historically as being a, a, a warranty provider for privately built homes with the volume builders. But we've been acting with institutional landlords um, from the, 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 the um, housing associations, sector, local authorities, and build to rent for many years as well. And 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 as I said before, we are looking to de-risk as much as possible any development. The reason we do that, we're taking it on our own books as, a, as, yeah. as, as an insurer. So we have an incredible amount of rigour in our, de in our, in our de um, development reviews, inspections and, and everything like that, so that we get to the point where we are signing off a home or a building that will have sound assessors on and we've taken the much, as much of the risk out of it as possible. Um, we're working with also with, with, with the sector. I recognise some of some of the uh, schemes you had on there, and it's good to see that it's not just a, you're saying it's not just about high rise. We're working with Sigma came to us um, with Countrywide Countryside, sorry, um, um, for their development programme, and we put together a flexible package for them, um, and that was on low rise. Um, traditional looking homes. Equally, we get forward funded models and forward funding is a, is a huge benefit to contractors, huge benefit because it gives them certainty and supply. It means they can increase their capacity. And because we're able to work with them from an earlier stage and we've got the, um, we have a major projects team which is focused pro solely on, on, on high rise, high density developments for that reason, um, we're able to work with those clients to, to, to sign things through and, and give the assurance to the lender and the investor that their asset will be protected. It's all about comfort, isn't it? Yeah. So I bravely talked about Slido earlier, but I'm not sure whether we have them in the breakout sessions, but we've got a few minutes later. Is there any questions that anyone would like to ask the panel in the room? I have got some more if you haven't. Anyone? Don't be shy. <laughs> Obviously, after a little bit too much lunch slump at the moment. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. There's a microphone coming. Thanks. Uh, Faraz Barber from uh, Terence O'Rourke. So, uh, <laughs> not done his homework. <laughs> shiny strategic plan, really helpful, really clear. Nice section on home ownership. Mm -hmm. So very clear what the ambition is from Home in England on this. And of course, there is a section about loans and supports around institutional investment, which we've we've heard quite a lot about today. Uh, where's the appetite for Homes England in actually bringing product itself? in the BTR sector, because of course, while I think it's right that you're partnering with the likes of Delancey and Quintain, actually part of your sort of manifesto or your plan is around affordable rent and, and bringing that product to the market. Is there an appetite in actually looking at how you might use the land that you're buying? Because uh, you're doing a lot of land intervention as well, yeah. and converting that into Homes England product for affordable rent. Is, is there an appetite there? Is direct delivery. A direct yeah. delivery. Gareth, do you want to? Yeah, so I think touched on it. One of the, the reasons why we were actually keen, particularly looking at the Sigma product, was looking at something that would be suitable for our estate. So taking that forward, market testing it uh, from an institutional investor perspective, and also actually take up from occupiers. Um, was really important. We have to sat, you know, persuade our colleagues on, who are responsible for delivering our sites that this is something that will work. The fact that we've got it going, it's going well, means now that I think we will be able to take forward family PRS and potentially other, other forms of tenure on our sites. We'll also, on the affordable side, we can take a view on what we will put onto our sites. So it's not necessarily driven by value returns in terms of that. If we decide working with our local partners that 
35%, 40 whatever it might be, or in London with the GLA, 50%, is the right thing to do on sites and there is con public sector control of the land, then that will allow us to do that. It will allow us to put bill to rent on there if on that particular site we think there will be that market, market demand. So it's definitely something that we will be doing a lot more on. So do you have a number in mind? Because you've got 300,000 homes a year that has to be delivered. Is there a notional figure that, together with Sophie, on, on that product that you might want to aim to achieve? Um, it's difficult to be precise. I mean, David Luntz did a really interesting talk last night at the pre-conference dinner where in London he was actually saying there the GLA analysis was taking, it, taking up almost 50% of new development was coming through build to rent combined with affordable housing as well. So you were t but those tenures were actually becoming the, the, the majority provider of new homes in London. I think in terms of what we do on our sites, we are going to be constrained by what the specific markets and market requirements will be for, the, for build to rent and then on the affordable tenures, um, what's right for those specific sites, what the local demand is going to be. But I think across both built to rent and affordable tenure, it's going to be a very significant proportion of that. And I could see it quite easily be delivering half of the, the homes that will be delivered across Homes England development or Homes England developments where we're investing, but maybe not controlling. I think to add to that as well, what we are, so we, w we won't do direct delivery at the moment. We're not set up to do that. We're very much enabling partners to do that. But also that we try and challenge our partners about, we've talked a bit about acceleration enabling, but it's, you know, what we're trying to make sure is that we're building those balanced communities for the future, mm. that there is a mix, and absolutely, as Gareth says, that we are appropriate. But, for example, some of the large out of, out of sort of, out of London M25 schemes, the big schemes that we see, we are really encouraging those developers to think it's not just private sale and affordable, it's really thinking about that mix of 10 years, having the opportunity to have a much broader range of housing, affordable capital A and small A is definitely what we are committed to do, but we won't be doing it directly for now anyway, it's very much about enabling and bringing our land with an, an appetite for that. And I don't think we need to be a, an actual builder no. at the moment, there are enough people who can do that and will do that and I think we can influence with that. Well, I think our, we can make our funding go further if we're not funding yeah. the full cost yeah. of every home. So yeah. I think if we get to a stage where it's <clears throat> proven that actually us taking a more active role, then we'll consider that as we go yeah. forward. But You know, and if I may say, actually, actually, I think what, you know, something that Homes England does really well, I mean, you happen to have Delancey and Quintain represented here, and we're big developers. But actually, Homes England, I think, you know, you're right, I, I believe your resources are, be are better utilized and more efficiently utilized by getting more people building more homes. And I think your program, when it does so well, you go down to five million pounds loan size. That means that you have your smaller and regional developers getting finance to build residential products, you know, in all 10 years um, across the country and not relying upon a handful of large developers to deliver the 300,000 units that we need to, to get built per year in this country. I mean, a really good example of that two or three years ago is where we worked with a, an SME developer on a small scheme in Hoddleston, probably 35, 40 homes. But off the back of that, we saw the talent and skill that were in that. They were trying to then secure a site from the MOD, the Kitchener Barracks down in Chatham, which was going to take them into a completely new territory in terms of scale. They were struggling to get finance to do that because we knew about their performance. We were able to back them. They were then able to show to a broader market, and they were actually mm -hmm. quite heavily involved in modular construction as well in terms of that, that delivery. That, that actually then meant other lenders were looking at them saying, yeah, actually we can back them. So it meant they could refinance us out, and they're now taking forward a range of schemes very successfully. Um, so there is that bit where we can grow and pull things, pull things forward. And Kath, I think you kind of... Yeah, actually, I was going to say it from the other side. Um, I'm going to blow smoke up your asses. Thanks. But, um, like that. Fundamentally, having worked with this team, what the great part is is that, you know, sometimes if you... The perception of public sector is that it can be 
um, a little bit sort of box ticking and the rest of it. These guys think about what ne what is needed and they grow and they're flexible. And if you come in and say, I've got this problem, can you think, you know, can you think about how we can solve it? They're right with you trying to mm. solve it and trying to get those homes happening. And I think those skills are way better used in helping other people solve real life problems than them trying to sort of compete with us, if that makes sense. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to just ask one, I'll, I'll throw one missile in and then just give my back, which is, I, I, get, I get the function of what you're trying to achieve. My, my only exam question in my mind is, you have two major developers. Now, I can understand the Athletes Village, easy conversion, obvious conversion, legacy, etc. It, it seems to be right. Quintain, I mean, I just went to see Chelsea and Man City the other day, came out of the stadium. It feels like a huge amount of overdevelopment and oversupply in one go. I, I, I wonder in my own mind, you know, because of the ambition of acceleration, which is what this is a numbers game to a degree, Actually, is that going to be good for Wembley? I'm d I asked the exam question in my own mind because there feels a huge amount of supply and I wonder how much of that is going to get occupied in the time frame it, in the acceleration that's come forward. And therefore, in my mind, I'm thinking, is that the best use of public money supporting a scheme at such an acceleration where the market might not be there to occupy all of those units in, in any one place? And that is... Yeah. I guess there's a point about acceleration, but acceleration in a in a moderate way, which can be spread across not just parts of London, but obviously the rest yeah. of England. And I think, and Kath, I'll let you come in in a second. Um, it is a massive amount of housing, but there is a massive housing crisis. And if you look at Wembley, so Kit talked earlier about sort of building places that we're proud of and communities and design, and Wembley's very much planned, and I'll let Kath talk about this in a second, around um, different villages and different places. So we do need to have big development, and we do need to see big numbers, and particularly in the metro me metropolis. You know, in the city, there's a, in London, there's a lot of people that need homes, and there is a massive demand for builder rent, and I think... As a government agency, yes, we have a responsibility to make sure that we are putting the money in the right places. But what we are trying to do is make sensible risk, you know, moderated decisions about who are the developers that are able to do this. Um, Kath, do you just want to add anything? We are tight. Yeah, oh, that's fine. I can but, see the flashing yeah. light. Um, time will tell. We obviously back ourselves and believe that it will be a flying success. Um, we're part of Brent. Brent has very high um, targets in terms of new home delivery. We are a significant proportion of that, but in no way are we, you know, the whole game. There are a lot other, of other uh, developments going on that are needed elsewhere, and, you know, that has been assessed by other people. So I sort of, I sort of stand back and think, actually, it's the housing crisis point of view. Um, when we build them, people do come. Uh, we're leasing up at a, um, at a very fast pace for all of the ones that we have delivered, way quicker than our business plan says, touch wood. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. But um, come along in two years' time and we'll yeah. show you. Yeah. Right, we are definitely out of time. Okay. So hopefully you'll join me in thanking the panel. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks very much. Thank